What's the only weekly wrap-up of the top compliance and ethics stories? It is This Week in FCPA with Tom Fox, the voice of compliance, and Jay Rosen, Mr. Monitor. Each week, Tom and Jay highlight 10 stories which caught their collective eye, talk about sports and movies, highlight top podcasts, and preview their upcoming events. Join This Week in FCPA each week for a one-stop review of the week's compliance and ethics highlights. This Week in FCPA is a production of the Compliance Podcast Network. In this episode, we look at a SFO trial victory convicting two ex-funeral employees and some controversy that's arisen since then. The EU Court of Justice invalidates privacy seal shield. Jonathan Armstrong and Quartery Compliance lead the commentary. The SEC and its China problem, Francine McKenna in The Dig. The biggest gold scandal ever, John Rausch and dipping through geometries. The UK imposes Magnitsky sanctions. Dick Casson reports in the FCPA blog. The SEC has a $3 million whistleblower award. Is it time for digital transformation and compliance? How to conduct an audit in a high-risk region? Did ego lead to Wirecard's failure? I think the answer to that is uh, definitely yes. Podcasts and upcoming webinars all on This Week in FCPA. This Week in FCPA is a production of the Compliance Podcast Network and a proud member of C-Suite Radio. Hello, everyone. This is Tom Fox, the voice of compliance, together with Mr. Monitors himself, Jay Rosen, back again for this week in FCPA, episode 214 for the week ending July 17, 2020. The SFO gets a win. Jay, the SFO finally got a conviction at trial. Things are very bad here in Houston around COVID-19. I don't think much better in uh, sunny Southern California. So uh, we are staying safe, but we're back to look at some of the week's top compliance and ethics stories. We're going to start with the SFO itself because they finally got some convictions at trial. Two of three former Uno oil executives uh, were um, convicted. Susan Holly reported in the FCPA blog, these were around uh, payments for bribe payments in Iraq to garner contracts. Um, the uh, apparently, though, there's some criticism of the SFO, specifically Lisa Ozofsky, uh, as reported by uh, Reuters. The judge uh, basically was very upset with. Uh, comments made to SFO Director Lisa Ozofsky by an individual who was some sort of a freelance supporter of um, the Os- Asani family, uh, who, of course, had pled guilty in the United States. There's quite a controversy over how they got to the United States and why the United States was able to get them, but they did. They pled guilty, and they've been uh, flipping to uh, authorities here in the United States. So, um, a win finally for the SFO, but there may be a cloud under that, and we'll have to follow that cloud and see how it plays out going forward. Uh, so next up, uh, keeping with our news from the other side of the pond, uh, this story comes to us from the Wall Street Journal from Catherine Stupp, and uh, the piece is entitled, Companies Worry EU Court Ruling Could Disrupt Global Data Change, uh, rather transfers. Companies that do business in Europe are worried that a long-anticipated court ruling this week could disrupt how they transfer personal data to countries around the world. The European Union's highest court decided today, Thursday, that a widely used tool for moving data from the bloc to outside countries is legal. Companies have started looking for alternative methods to continue transferring personal data information around the world ahead of this ruling. European personal personal data is protected under the General Data Protection Regulation, which we know as GDPR, and companies must prove it remains protected when they move it to other countries. The European Court of Justice will determine whether a mechanism known as standard contract clauses is sufficient enough to keep data data private, private outside the bloc. In December, a legal advisor to the European Court said data protection authorities should block some data transfers using standard contractual clauses if companies can't guarantee information remains secure. Standard contractual clauses are the most most popular method used to send data outside the U.S. 
And it would be a big, annoying mess if the court rules standard contractual clauses can no longer be used, said Bernhard Rennell, Senior Corporate Compliance Manager at Fossil Inc. The case at the Court of Justice stems from a complaint filed in 2013 by Australian lawyer Max Schrems, who argued that data is exposed to government surveillance in the U.S., Tech firms can be required to provide intelligence authorities with data from non-U.S. citizens. If the court rules that the standard contractual clauses can't sufficiently protect data and is therefore illegal, companies would have to use another legal tool. Um, So now we're going to jump to our friend Jonathan Armstrong, who has a client alert from Cordry Compliance, and it says data transfer ECJ declares standard contractual clauses valid in Facebook case, but strikes down privacy shield. The European court decided that the standard contractual, which Facebook had been using to transfer data to the U.S., were valid, but the EU-U.S. privacy shield, the scheme which European commissioners put in place to replace Safe Harbor, was invalid. This ruling does not just affect 5,378 businesses registered in the Privacy Shield scheme, but given the additional focus on due diligence and any data transfers, every organization will have work to do to make sure it complies. The upshot of this is that not enough there is not enough to simply have SCCSs in place, but due diligence also needs to be undertaken and possibly additional protections added. That due diligence will need to be done not only in the other party to the agreement, but also on the legal regime in the country where it's based. Data protection authorities across the EU will also be expected to step up their enforcement of data transfer requirements from GDPR. So what did the European Court say about Privacy Shield specifically? The court decided that Privacy Shield, the safe harbor, like Safe Harbor, was invalid. Essentially, there's not enough checks and balances in U.S. domestic law concerning the access and the use by U.S. public authorities of data transferred from the EU in a way that gives EU data subject equivalent protection of the EU law. So what happens next? Negotiations have already started with the U.S., presumably for Safe Harbor 3, Privacy Shield 2, or whatever it's going to be called as negotiations in the U.S. for greater concessions may be made more problematic by the current Trump administration's unwillingness to make major concessions previously and by the fact that it's a U.S. election shield. Mr. Schrem said after the judgment, the court clarified for a second time now that there is a clash between EU privacy law and the U.S. surveillance law. And as the EU will not change its fundamental rights to please the NSA, The only way to overcome this class is for the U.S. to introduce solid privacy rights for all people. So a big ruling there, going to upset a lot of apple carts. What's your take on it, Tom? Yeah, a very important ruling with Privacy Shield going away um, and the standard contractual clauses becoming extraordinarily more difficult to utilize. It's going to be difficult to get data from the U.K. and E.U. over to the United States. Uh, Privacy Shield turned on a government um, ag- or government-to-government agreement between the E.U. and the United States. Uh, it was pretty clear from the start that that the U.S. government side of the agreement was not, as the uh, EU court called, proportional. Um, and additionally, there's no protection for the rights of EU citizens from government government surveillance. Uh, obviously, a different focus on data privacy between the EU and the United States. Uh, under the Trump administration at this point, uh, with them cratering towards uh, an election disaster, I doubt they'll do anything. I'm sure they'll be uh, completely... Um, Im, 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 immobilized to do anything. So companies are going to have to step up and the uh, requirements around co- uh, contractual, uh, the standard contractual clauses have become much more difficult. So it's going to be uh, a really big challenge. And hopefully when the, the Biden administration comes in, they can get something worked out to get a, a First, we had Safe Harbor. Now we have Privacy Shield. I don't know what Phase 3 is going to bring, but um, uh, it really does muddle the water. And I had a long chat with Jonathan Armstrong uh, today. We did an emergency podcast on this, and um, he's uh, preparing for lots of, lots of, lots of questions to which he doesn't really know the answers to yet. So very muddled waters, Jay. 
So uh, next up, you take a visit with our friend Francine McKenna. What's Francine thinking about in the dig? So I have to shout out to uh, Francine around um, her uh Endeavor venture uh, new gig at the dig. Um, she's uh, a well known former audit partner, and then she started a blog, Enray the Auditors. Then she went to professional journalism with Market Watch, and now she's out on her own. And, and I would really say, I, I would just urge everyone to subscribe to the dig. Um, Francine Holt, I mean, she does not pull her punches. Uh, she goes full bore, and now that she's on her own, she is, uh, how we can say, uh, unrestrained. Um, and today, or in this article, we look at uh, the China problem. And I think everyone knows that when it comes to Chinese companies, they are completely opaque. Um, they don't give you information. They claim they can't get information out of China and give it to you for uh, U.S. markets. This is obviously antithetical. Transparency is a key uh, component of SEC, SEC oversight. So there was uh, Francine really discusses how to to maybe take a look at some of these problems, and she points towards a more robust auditor oversight forced by the PCAOB and SEC. Uh, but it's really a great article, and I can't really speak highly enough of uh, what she's done at the dig in the, in the, I think, six to nine months she's been there. So check it out. Uh, if you're thinking about investing in a uh, Chinese company on the U.S. Stock Exchange, all I can say is don't. Um, you're never going to get any information, and you're going to lose your ass. So, um that's so I deal with the China problem. So continuing on with our China theme, uh, we visit with our good friend Jonathan Rush and his uh, excellent uh, blog, Dipping Through Geometries. And uh, this is a headline you won't see often. Chinese company King Gold Jewelry used fake gold bars to obtain $2.8 billion with a B in financial and institutional loans. So I didn't even know that. People use gold bars anymore, but uh, this will be interesting here. On June 29th, Chinese media group Caxon, I hope I pronounced that correctly, said reported that the Chinese jewelry company Wuhan King Gold Jewelry, which we'll call King Gold, had received a total of $2.8 billion from at least 14 Chinese financial institutions over the last five years. And used as collateral was 83 tons of purportedly gold bars that later proved to be gilded copper. The fake gold was exposed in this February 2020 when one of King Gold's lenders, Dongan Tusk, sought to liquidate King Gold's collateral to cover debts. In late 2019, King Gold allegedly failed to repay investors in several trust products. King Gold was being investigated by unspecified authorities. Because the company is traded on NASDAQ, however, the apparent fraud could also attract the U.S. Department of Justice and the Securities and Exchange Commission for criminal and civil investigations. For example, in its Form 10-Q for the quarter ending September 30th, 2019, King Gold affirmatively represented that it had pledged gold as collateral for financial institution loans and particularly stated that to secure a $280 million loan from Sichuan Trust, it had pledged 7,258 kilograms of gold. Now, the size of this alleged fraud substantially dwarfs the recent discovered $300 million accounting fraud at another Chinese company, Luckin Coffee, which we've spoken about before on this podcast. The Kingo situation is likely to heighten the scrutiny of Chinese companies trading in U.S. markets and to prompt further questions about the degree of chair that Chinese financial institutions are using when collateralizing loans. So just another positive step in U.S.-China uh uh, associations, right? Well, uh, you do have to give uh, Kingo credit for their uh, fraud here. Um, multi-billion dollar fraud, uh, painting <laughs> painting bars, gold. Uh, I, I, I almost would suggest to you, Jay, that this may have been done before. Um, but sometimes the old scams uh, are so old that uh, people forgot them. So um, pretty amazing stuff. What says Dick Casson on the FCPA blog this week? 
So Dick uh, told us about the UK imposing its first uh, Magnitsky sanctions. Uh, This is uh, similar to the U.S. uh, Magnitsky law, which allows sanctions on individuals who violated uh, human rights and uh, engaged in human rights abuses over the years. Uh, This came about because of Bill Browder, who had employed uh, Sergei Magnitsky, the Russian lawyer who died in a Moscow prison after exposing a a large multimillion dollar tax fraud. The uh, government, uh, UK government, uh, has uh, finally enacted the law and uh, it um, gave its first or put its first sanctions list together. So uh, congratulations to Bill Browder. It's certainly a, uh, a big plus step forward in the international uh, struggle for human rights and a uh, great article from Dick on it. Uh, next up, we have a press release from the SEC, and uh, they have issued a $3.8 million whistleblower award. This happened in D.C. on Bastille Day, July 14th. And the SEC announced the $3.8 million award to a whistleblower who provided significant information that helped the SEC disrupt an ongoing fraudulent scheme. The resulting enforcement action returned millions of dollars to harmed investors. Since the beginning of this program nearly 10 years ago, the SEC has ordered more than $2.5 billion with a B in financial remediation based on whistleblowers' information including more than $1.4 billion in disgorgement and prejudgment interest, of which almost 750 had been returned or scheduled to be returned to harmed investors. The SEC has awarded approximately $505 million to 87 individuals since issuing its first award in 2012, and the awards include uh, 20 individuals in the last 10 months, totaling $119 million. All payments are made out of the investor fund established by Congress that is financed through monetary sanctions paid to the SEC. And this, as we know, all stems forth from the Dodd-Frank Act, and that's why the SEC has set up the whistleblowers campaign, the office, and as always, those folks who blow the whistle, unlike other parts of the government, are offered complete anonymity. There was a a really interesting article article on CCI from Adam Schinder, and he talks about the need for a digital transformation and compliance. And one of the things I've observed from the coronavirus health crisis and even the uh, my podcast series, Compliance and Coronavirus, has is rather that the coronavirus health crisis has accelerated trends that were already in place and in play, but accelerated them in a way that I think is going to permanently change many of the ways we do business and certainly the way we do compliance. And one of those is the digital transformation of compliance. Uh, it's, it's forced on us because uh, compliance practitioners are having to work virtually just as everyone else is, and uh, international travel may not be back for six months, 12 months, 18 months, maybe even 24 months. Uh, Now, I know you and your colleagues have worked very diligently to help companies work through the unavailability of travel uh, through remote risk assessments, through remote culture assessments, and remote monitoring. But I think for the corporate compliance practitioner, it's going to be a lot more digital going forward. It's going to be a lot more uh, utilization of internal controls. It's going to be a lot more looking at numbers. I took a look at the Alexian uh, FCPA enforcement action this week. And uh, yesterday I wrote about uh, the background and, and the bribery schemes. But today I just went through all the bribery schemes and said, here's how data analytics would have uncovered this. So uh, I think the compliance profession is ripe for this. I think uh, Adam is absolutely spot on. It, cl- compliance is in need of a digital transformation. The, uh, the days of compliance by lawyers, for lawyers, written by lawyers, uh, with policies and procedures and case law citation, um, that's going to go the, the, by the way of the dinosaur. So um, uh, interesting piece from Adam, and it's something I'm going to write about uh, probably uh, quite a bit in the second half of the year. Great. So next up, uh, re- returning to a website we haven't been to in a little while, the Risk and Compliance Platform Europe. Uh, writing this article is a gentleman named Alex Movchen, and Alex is uh, a CI, CIA, CICCA, CFE, and president of the Institute for Internal Controls, <coughs> excuse me, uh, the Ukraine and Belarus chapter. 
He's also head of international controls, a global medical company. Uh, he decided to take a look at core points of focus while conducting audit engagement in regions with high fraud and compliance risks. And he is speaking with Olga Lakashenko, who is an audit director at Renda Netherlands. This first interview that they did was conducted and can be found on the platform under related items, which was about planning and executing audit engagements during the COVID-19 crisis. This particular talk with Olga covers topics of conducting audit engagements in regions with high levels of exposure to fraud and corruption. Uh, Olga specializes working with clients on activities based in Eastern Europe and Central Asia. Often she is asked to consider these clients at high risk, but have some measures in place to mitigate these risks, including knowledge of local business culture and language skills. Sometimes she finds herself like a translator, but not from a different language, but but translating different cultural aspects. Um, the, her colleagues focus more on projects in the Western Europe, but these p- folks have no idea of what kind of company it was or what kind of circumstances are needed to be taken into account. After identifying risks of fraud, the auditor then assesses the probability of the risk of fraud occurring and its impact in financial statements. Some regions where you have depth of experience are marked in Transparency International's Corruption Perception 2019 report with those with rather high risk of corruption and fraud. Olga says uh, that here is risk and corruption and how and which members of an organization must be discussed with. You should speak with management prior to the client acceptance and at the final stage of an audit. Compliance officers at the client's acceptance stage, the audit committee, the audit committee during the pre-audit meeting, clients' representatives while executing the audit procedures, quality controller, and the forensics review team. It's important not only to discuss fraud and corruption in a very detailed way, but it's also properly to record the minutes of these discussions. The auditor shall document these discussions of significant matters with management and those charged with governance and others, including the nature of the significant matters discussed and when and with whom that took place. Irrespective of the author's assessments of these risks, the engagement team should at least perform audit procedures that address the risk of management override in the financial reporting process. These may relate to making adjustments to recorded journals or other adjustments, tendencies for reporting fraud related to accounting firms, and finally, significant transactions outside the ordinary course of business or transactions that appear otherwise unusual. Of course, understanding and knowledge on where to focus during an audit engagement, not to miss significant risks, including fraud risk, comes with experience, but it's definitely a good starting point. Regardless of the level of experience one might have, the report to the nations on occupational fraud and abuse issued by the ACFE is a good source of information, and it's a great place to get an understanding of the most frequent ways how risks materialize. So uh, this interview between Alex and Olga is available on uh, Risk and Compliance Platform Europe. And as always, we will link to it in the show notes. Tom, uh, you're going back to CCI. What does Michael Toby have to say? So Mike uh, has, I think, a pretty prescient look at Wirecard, and he basically compares it to uh, going back to my most formative scandal, Enron, where you had hubris, ego, uh, clearly corrupt people at the top. Uh, Whether Marcus Braun started as corrupt as Ken Lay or not is unknown at this point, but clearly he ended as corrupt as Ken Lay and Jeff Skilling, Andy Fastow, and the whole group of uh, criminals from Enron. And and he says that um, there was an oversight failure. There were red flags parent uh, that, that he doesn't see this as really even nothing new uh, in a particularly insightful uh, paragraph. He even cites Mike Volkoff, uh, who talked about um, the Bluebell, who's written extensively about the Bluebell scandal, which uh, and he quoted him for that fish rots from the head down. Um, but that uh, this is not really anything new. It's just bigger. So um, and he reminds us that uh, Elizabeth Holmes and uh uh, Wells Fargo. It's all hubris. And so don't forget about what Jonathan Marx calls the fraud pentagon uh, of ego, hubris, overconfidence, and greed. 
So uh, a lot's to digest. Uh, I think we're going to be unpacking Wirecard for uh, some time. Not that uh, I would ever blow the horn of my podcast network, but uh, together with uh, your partner, uh, Macau Reader Gordon, we are going to take a deep dive in multiple podcasts on Wirecard. Our first one goes up uh, next Monday on the FCPA Compliance Report. She is thoroughly, thoroughly into this case, and it was a real pleasure to do one podcast with her. So we're going to kind of follow this as it goes. But this is just a a fascinating story and a a real dent in the uh, quality brand of Germany, Inc. So uh, speaking of podcasts, we're two weeks into the month of July. Who are you speaking with this month on the um, Compliance Life? So the Compliance Life, Jay, is the podcast where I take a look at or visit rather with a CCO about his experience, his or her experiences going heading to the CCO chair, what they found there, what they found after they may have left. And this month I'm joined by Scott Sullivan. Scott's the Chief Integrity and Compliance Officer at Newport Mining. We've had two episodes. In the first one, he talked about the need for a CCO to have empathy, um, channeling um uh, you must uh, walk in someone else's shoes. Uh, second is, and in, in part two, rather, uh, we looked at uh, Scott's thoughts on reading the tea leaves and staying ahead of the corporate wolf pack and how he was able to do that uh, successfully. So um, th- this has really turned into one of my most popular podcasts very quickly. And, Jay, it's what's fun for me about it is it's sitting down with one of these CCOs in a very informal atmosphere. Uh, obviously, it's done virtually, but uh, tell people it's a virtual cup of coffee with Tom. And we just sit and they just tell their story. And, and they love telling it. They know their story better than anyone. And it really has, there's a lot for a compliance professional who aims to sit in the CCO chair uh, to learn from these uh, currently sitting CCOs. So, Tom, let me give you a moment to catch your breath. And why don't you tell our listeners about this month's edition of 31 Days to a More Effective Compliance Program, which I will note is sponsored by Affiliated Monitor. It is, and we thank you. Uh, It's been a great series this month. We're looking at third parties, obviously the greatest FCPA risk. Um, On Monday, I ask, are you looking at the how question in due diligence, not simply who? Tuesday was metrics on third-party management. Wednesday, managing third parties. On Thursday, was auditing third parties. And then today, on Friday, it's ongoing monitoring of third parties. Uh, once again, this uh, podcast series is sponsored by Affiliated Monitor, so shout out to AMI. Uh, 31 Days to a More Effective Compliance Program has its own iTunes channel. So if you want to uh, uh, geek out and line up a bunch of iTunes episodes and listen to them. They're eight minutes long with three key takeaways, so you can pick up a lot um, of information in a pretty short time. Jay, there are some great AMI webinars coming up. Why don't you tell our audience about them? Thanks. So uh, next uh, Wednesday, July 22nd at 12 p.m. Eastern Time, 9 a.m. Pacific, my colleagues Jesse Kaplan, Deb Waugh, and Amy Fogelman We'll be looking at navigating the risk of prescribing opioids for chronic pain in the COVID-19 area. So, rather, era. It's a very uh, timely subject matter, and uh, the team really brings three different perspectives to this issue. And uh, please uh, follow the uh, sign-up registration information here on the show notes. Second thing, and we're bringing back my colleague, uh, Mikhail Reeder-Gordon, with her colleagues, David Shanka and Jonathan Redgrave. It's a really interesting subject, and it's called Computers Say No, Mitigating Legal and Ethical Risks and Public Agency Use of Automated Decision-Making Tools. So this is something that's uh, right in um, Mikhail's uh, sweet spot, and she's got a group of uh, folks who are very well-versed in the subject. And, Tom, why don't you tell us about what's happening uh, two weeks from Friday on July 30th? Uh, Jay, EC, uh, ECI is having a best practices forum, and this one's going to be really great because Pat Harnett has lined up uh, Brian Rabbit, the acting assistant attorney general for the criminal division, who's going to talk about the FCPA resource guide second edition, which was released on July 2nd. We talked about that extensively in last week's podcast, but here we're going to hear directly from the uh, the, he- uh, the head of the head person over 
criminal division uh, at the Department of Justice. So it's going to be a, a fabulous uh, event. Uh, once again, uh, ECI Best Practices Forum. Jay, I would note that we've uh, linked to information and registration on all of these great webinars uh, in the show notes. So uh, check them out, and I hope that uh, you uh, will also uh, join me in attending these events. And uh, one more thing, because you can always talk about one more great podcast. Uh, we're recording this. It's on Thursday, and which dropped today was the latest edition of Everything Compliance. We had the whole gang together, and we took a spirited view of what's happening with Novartis. And uh, there are some verbal fireworks. So if you're looking for a little uh, something spicy on the ethics and compliance side, please take a look at Everything Compliance. So on behalf of Tom Fox, the voice of compliance, and myself, Jay Rose and Mr. Monitor, we'd like to thank you for joining us for This Week in FCPA, episode 214 for the week ending July 17th, 2020, the SFO gets a win. Um, With our cautionary ending, we hope that you and yours are safe and well and taking care of yourselves, and we hope to visit with you next week to talk more about next week, but it will be this week in the FCPA. Hello, everyone. This is Tom Fox again. I'd like to thank you for listening to this episode of This Week in FCPA. If you have any questions, you can email Jay at jrosen at affiliatedmonitors.com. You can email me, Tom Fox, at tfox at tfoxlaw.com. We also got a new really cool app on the Compliance Podcast Network website where you can leave a voicemail or a message if you'd like to ask us a question or have a topic you would like us to consider. I hope you'll join us again next week when Jay and I look at some of the top compliance and ethics stories for the week that is to become. This Week in FCPA is a production of the Compliance Podcast Network and a proud member of C-Suite Radio. Thanks again for listening, and we look forward to visiting with you again.